This is Football America, the game played using your feet, or a foot, and a ball. So, football began in England, not Greece or China. It's ours. It is ours. Okay, so in regards to ancient Greece, there was a team game known as Episkyros, which was noted down by Antiphanes in the 4th century BC, and a Roman game as well, Harpastum, that was based on the same game. However, both games are more related to rugby as it involved throwing a ball over a white line on your opponent's side of a area, a field, a pitch, whatever they called it back then. It also involved a high level of violence and a low level of intelligence, which is again, more similar to rugby. Now around the 3rd century, the Chinese developed a game called Kuju. Now there are lots of different ways that they pronounce this game and say this game. I'm going to say Kuju because it's the easiest one to say. And it is a game that involved kicking a ball through an open net without the use of hands. But personal skill development was more important than scoring goals. Because back then, a foul was when you did something wrong in a game. For example, you kicked a ball too far out of play. It was a foul and your points got deducted. So that basically just made the game focused on making less mistakes than your opponents, not scoring goals. The game was also largely played by the upper classes and began to decline during the Ming Dynasty in the 14th century due to the neglect and the fact that it sounds shit. There are also many accounts of other games that are similar to today's football or rugby by Eskimos in Greenland, Native Americans, all the way to the indigenous people in Australia. So we're gonna skip forward there and next came mob football, which was seen in Britain from around the 9th century. Basically, during this game, an unlimited number of people, usually, you know, the teams would be one town versus another, would stick a ball in between the towns and the game. So, for example, Town A would have to get the ball past Town B's church, and Town B would have to get the ball past Town A's school. Imagine foul football on a ridiculous scale. The only rules against this were murder and manslaughter. That was it. Anything goes. They still do this today in some towns, obviously, uh, with a lesser scale of violence, but it was absolute madness. And understandably, for the next few centuries, football kept getting banned by the likes of King Edward III and King Henry IV. So let's move on to more things related to today's football and how that really started. The public schools in Britain during the 16th century, and by public I mean private, it's just in Britain we say public, which is private, which is ridiculous because they're basically the opposite of each other, decided that teamwork was good and wanted to take it away from the mob mentality, but sadly it wasn't completely removed from the game as it does remain in such places as Millwall and Leeds. So during this time, kicking, running, teams, positions, referees and coaches became integrated into the game and to this day I still wish coaches were called training maesters because that sounds amazing and football here again was a lot more like rugby so fast forward into the 18th century and football was still pay played in public private schools so to confuse women everywhere and to get revenge on them for always saying no when they mean yes but men are supposed to know what they mean so we don't love them enough because we cannot read their minds the offside rule was created 1848 is where rugby and football really began to split with the Cambridge rules where 12 representatives from schools came together to make the game more kicking based not handling based and the decisions made it only stayed within the public private schools but arguably had a huge influence on the creation of what later would become the FA the Football Association. In 1851, Richard Linden and William Gilbert showed off their new round and oval shaped balls at the Great Exhibition in London. And they were the first footballs with rubber bladders, you know, again, in the inside of the football that is more similar to today's standards. In 1857, the world's oldest club, Sheffield FC, was formed. However, they played Sheffield rules, which I imagine consisted of arguing over who was the most tight-fisted with their money, gulping tea and shouting about how much they hate Southerners, all whilst refusing to use the letter T because that's a posh upper-class letter. October 1863 saw the first meeting of the Football Association, known as the FA, with the aim of unifying the game into a single code that they would all play and regulate together. The public-private schools declined to join except Charterhouse and Uppingham and after the third meeting a draft set of rules were created and December 8th 
saw the laws of football published, but using your hands was still used within the game, and that is when the first game of FA Rules was played, with 90-minute matches being introduced in 1866, and the first time was London against Sheffield, and that is when the use of handling was stopped. By 1870, Royal Engineers AFC were playing the first and truest kind of scientific football, where modern-esque passing was used, and they were the first team that was described as playing beautifully together. The first 1-2 football and recorded short pass came at a match just after between Derby School and Nottingham Forest School in 1872, and Cambridge University were the first side to perfect a modern-like formation, with a very attacking-minded 2-3-5 pyramid. So for those who play football manager games, I do not advise using this formation. In 1871, the world's oldest national knockout tournament, the FA Cup, began with Wanderers beating the Royal Engineers 1-0 with a top bins 30-yard screamer by Morton Betts. In 1872, the first FIFA-recognised international match was played between Scotland and England in Hamilton which finished a thrilling 0-0. However, the following year, England beat Scotland in London to become the first team to win an international game, and therefore they were the best team ever in the world. There was a north-south divide in the years following this, though, as the north wanted to make football a professional sport because they couldn't afford to take time off work to play football whereas the Southerners wanted it to remain an amateur sport. In 1885, professional footballers were accepted into the game to avoid a footballing split, and the Football League was created in 1888, with the league of 12 clubs having six teams from Lancashire, because Lancashire is the best county in the world. The teams were Blackburn Rovers, Burnley, Accrington, Everton, Presser North End, Aston Villa, Derby County, Knox County, Stoke, West Bromwich Albion, Wolverhampton Wanderers, and the greatest team ever, Bolton Wanderers. And Preston won the first league championship without losing any of their 22 games. And they also won the FA Cup. Edging towards the 20th century, the teams based in the Midlands began to dominate, with the exception of Blackburn, who bagged five FA Cups between the 1880s and 1890s. In 1891, John Brodie created the first football net, and in 1892, Division 2 was added, and saw London's first team, Woolwich Arsenal, being added, as well as Liverpool. Manchester City were football's first dodgy side. The club had dominated the 1904 season, but were found to have had severe financial irregularities, which included paying some people £7 a week when the limit was four, you dirty dogs. And speaking of dodgy, FIFA was created in 1904, and football became an official competition at the 1908 London Olympics. The Sir Thomas Lipton Trophy held in Turin in 1909 is in a way the first World Cup because clubs were invited from different countries to participate and if you were in that competition, you were representing your country. So imagine Manchester United being invited to go and participate, they would be representing England. FIFA agreed to recognise the Olympic tournament as a World Football Championship for amateurs in 1914 and in 1920 the Summer Olympics saw the world's first intercontinental football competition with Belgium being the winners. 1930 was the first official FIFA World Cup as in the same one as we have today with Uruguay being seen as the first ever World Cup champions. The game stopped due to WW1 and grew once again on its return and by 1923 there were three English divisions and in the same year Wembley was opened and hosted its first FA Cup final, the White Horse final between Bolton and West Ham which finished 2-0 to Bolton. 21-year-old Dixie Dean bagged 60 goals for Everton during the 1928-1929 season, which is still unmatched. And in the 1930 season, the Coupe des Nations was held in Geneva, which was the first attempt at creating a cup competition where national champions from other countries would compete against each other, with Ujpest from Hungary winning that very first competition. The game stopped again, this time for the award-winning sequel to WW1, WW2. The first post-war trophy then went to Derby County, who beat Charlton Athletic 4-1, and the new season saw Liverpool lift the title. 
The European Champions Cup was conceived in Paris in 1955, which is what we know today as the Champions League. And it was won by Real Madrid, who came from behind to beat Stade de Rem 4-3. And during this time, football really began to evolve into what we know today. By the 1960s, top football countries had multiple divisions, national cups. There were two European competitions, a European International Cup and a World Cup. England won their first and only World Cup in 1966, but we don't like talking about that. Manchester United were the first English club to win a cup on the international scene with a 4-1 win over Benfica in 1968, as well as Leeds winning the Fairs Cup, you know, today's Europa League, in the same year. However, the 1970s and 80s were a dark period for football, which was riddled by hooliganism and disasters, which came to climax during two events, really. The 1985 European Cup final between Liverpool and Juventus saw 39 Juventus fans lose their lives, and it led to English clubs receiving a five-year international cup ban, with Liverpool getting six years. Recession and unemployment hit English football very hard, particularly in the north of England, and even prominent and historical teams such as Wolves, Burnley and Preston suffered consecutive relegations. It all came to a head in 1989 following the Hillsborough disaster, which forced the FA to modernise football by focusing on improved security, better stadiums, seating at the stadium and tougher punishment for hooligans and it really did help make a difference and make it safer as it is today. And the FA Premier League was formed in 1992 when the top 22 clubs in English football broke away from the Football League in an effort to increase their incomes and become more competitive on an international scale, not because of greed. The selling of TV rights in a separate deal to the Football League to Sky TV led football on a cash-rich journey that it is still on today. This deal made clubs money and in 1995 players got power. The Bosman rule gave the players that particular power. Prior to 1995, clubs basically owned and controlled players even when their contracts had expired. Jean-Marc Bosman played for RFC Liege and he wanted to join Dunkirk. However, they wouldn't pay the transfer fee that Liege demanded. And then following that, Bosman's wage was slashed by 75% and he wouldn't sign and he was taken to court as well. He went to the European Court of Justice and now today players can move for free when their contracts expire or even sign pre-contracts with clubs within six months of their current contract status, which is coming to an end. This gave players more power. However, players under 24 years old can still move, but they have to go to a transfer tribunal, but that's decided by a separate committee and not by any of the football clubs. Either way, players could use this to demand higher wages and longer contracts, and it's one of the many reasons why the wages of players uh, are as high as they are today, as well as the amount of agents that are infecting the game. The decision also banned European leagues from restricting how many foreign players a team could use. If they were European, it didn't matter anymore. In the past, United had a problem where they had Irish and Welsh players and they counted as foreign players. So that was removed. If you were European, you were no longer considered a foreign player. So this led to a huge increase in foreign players in the top flight of English football and in 1999 on Boxing Day Gianluca Viali's Chelsea side consisted solely of 11 foreign players in a win at Southampton. So today in terms of entertainment football is in amazing health it is just as good as ever however with the incredible increase in transfer fees and wages it cannot be long until the bubble bursts and more clubs go bust. Foreign investment is an absolute must and 57% of clubs in England's top two divisions are owned or controlled or led by foreign investors and 14 out of the 20 clubs in the Premier League are under foreign ownership. If they decide to leave, British football could see a financial meltdown. But that's for future people to worry about. Yay! So, until then, take it easy. If you like the video, please leave a like, maybe subscribe. Follow me on Twitter at Tricky underscore D. And as always, have a good one.